Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this webinar today. My name is uh, Jeremiah Kipainoi, and uh, today we will talk about politicians to end FGM. And um, as you've seen, and um, more and more people are joining, please go, uh, keep inviting more people to join this session. Uh, but uh, we'll just quickly introduce GMC as an organization and uh, what GMC does as uh, we go on. Um, the GMC, which is the Global Media Campaign, um, is an organization that works with campaigners and journalists, uh, journalists across eight African countries to end FGM, speci uh, speci specifically on the media. And uh, we basically work with uh, campaigners from the grassroots and uh, they do their own campaigns in their own languages with their own styles to end FGM within their communities. Today, we'll talk about how to end FGM on the media, specifically targeting uh, or speaking about politicians. Uh, and we will be kicking off right now when um, looking at what exactly we mean by campaigns on the media, we mean going there with influencers. We go. We mean going there with religious leaders, that could be politicians, uh, survivors, people that uh, people the audiences or the masses would want to listen to, uh, while spreading the NFGM message. So, if you want to become a campaigner, always go to our website, and you will also be able to sign up and uh, take classes, which will be available to you soon. So, without wasting time. I will just uh, kick it off with uh, giving, give, giving it over to Dominic Kimita as we uh, start off. Welcome, Mambolea. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremiah. It's a beautiful evening uh, here in Kenya, uh, joined by, by amazing, amazing guests uh, who are doing amazing work uh, in Africa and the world in general. And I, just as you said, media is one of the most powerful tools. Media is one of the most powerful tools uh, to, to engage um, uh, different stakeholders in the fight against female genital mutilation. You understand that uh, media in the past has been used to, to, to do a lot of other things. But recently now that a lot of our campaigners, a lot of activists, a lot of advocates are, are leveraging on, on the power of, of media, uh, generally traditional media and, and and social media just to make sure that uh, they rally efforts to fight uh, female genital mutilation in the world over in Kenya and uh, in Africa generally. So uh, just uh, just uh, to go straight to the point, today we are joined by uh, amazing, amazing guests uh, uh, who are here to just um, ignite a conversation in Africa on, on the power of, of engaging uh, politicians and duty bearers in the fight against uh, female genital mutilation. So uh, we, we have two amazing guests. Uh, the first one, uh, allow me to, 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 in, uh, to introduce her, is uh, Madam Rugiatu Nene Ture, uh, who is uh, from Sierra Leone. Maybe uh, kindly, uh, uh, Madam, uh, maybe if you can say a word before I, I give it to, to our next uh, guest, kindly. Yeah, thank you very much, Dominique. Um, my name is Rugiatu Nene Ture. Uh, founder of Amazonian Initiative Movement, an organization working to end the practice of FGM and chairperson for Forum Against Ample Traditional Practices, a coalition of civil society in Sierra Leone. Powerful, powerful. Just to mention to our, our, our viewers uh, tonight here in Kenya, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful evening. I, I don't know what the time is back there in, uh, in Sierra Leone. But uh, I, I want to just uh, make sure we, we have more, more pomp, more pomp to, to our guest. Um, Madam Rugiatu is a former Deputy Minister of Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs. Uh, she has been campaigning against female genital mutilation for over 20 years and just launched a policy engagement uh, campaign with cabinet ministers and, and uh, parliament uh, members in Sierra Leone. Beautiful, beautiful. Our next guest uh, is a, a gentleman from uh, uh, Nigeria, Mr. Bonfas Emenalo. Kindly start if maybe you can just introduce yourself. Thank you. Strength, uh, sorry, Mumboleo. Uh, Bonfis is still trying to join. So I think you just skip that and uh, we'll get back to you. Okay, perfect, perfect. 
Uh, thank you so much. So uh, as I was saying, I was saying that uh, media is one of the most powerful tools and uh, media has been used to capture stories, community stories, champion stories. Uh, but today yeah, we, we want to shift the focus to engage uh, our politicians and people who have been in power uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in different uh, spheres. And uh, we, we must, we must uh, agree that female genital mutilation is a policy issue. And uh, duty bearers in Africa have a very, very pivotal role in using policies to end uh, uh, societal pullbacks. There are a lot of uh, societal pullbacks in Africa right now. But female genital mutilation uh, comes out as one major, major societal pullback, and and that is why that is why we we thought it is important to to shift the focus on how how now do we bring on board the politicians, the duty bearers, the policy makers to this conversation of ending female genital mutilation. Uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe we can go first, Madam. Uh, why why do you think why do you think that it is time? Why do you think it is important to have politicians, policymakers, duty bearers in this conversation of ending female genital mutilation in Africa generally? Um, thank you very much again, and welcome to uh, all the participants. Um, first of all, I will like the participants and everybody to know that. Um, I personally decided to enter into politics because in Sierra Leone, it is believed that if you work against female genital mutilation, you will not win an election. And so I told them that is not true. As politicians, you have to be sincere, honest, and keep to your promises during your campaign. And so because there was that kind of saying, oh no, um, because the women in this country believe in the Bondo society, because for us here, FGM is practiced within the Bondo culture. And so therefore I said, I have been campaigning. I am going to try to contest an election to prove to you that it is not true. And so I contested an election and I won with the highest votes in my locality. So I send a message to politicians who still think they can continue to use FGM. And so while I was representing my people in council, I was able to influence to make sure FGM is added into the district development plan of our district. But I am a lone voice. And so I was trying to see how I can influence others. You know, in making a change, you need to be within where decisions are made. And it is our politicians who make the decision for the nation. So therefore, as I was working at the district, I continue my campaign. I was appointed as deputy minister in 2016. And during that time as a deputy minister, I was open to influence a change. And so what I did was to make sure we started engaging parliamentarians for the very first time. I used the forum against harmful traditional practices of which I was the chairperson at the time. And then I was able to influence to bring members of parliament to conferences where they started discussing female genital mutilation. And at another point, I was able to influence to have a minister to make a public open statement to condemn the practice. And I tried to see how I can influence for the country to approve the national strategy because it is only when the document is owned by the state that you can run along with it. It, it was not possible. Um, and then, so what happened now? In my country, Sierra Leone, FGM within the Bondo culture is used as a vote winner. Politicians usually sponsor the initiation of young girls into the Bondo society. 
as a means to buy votes of poor rural communities. They fund the construction of bundu houses. They, you know, they provide incentives for these activities to carry on. So it is very much key as these politicians have influence in their locality. They are expected. So if we get them to speak about the evil, people will understand. And Maybe. let me hasten to remind you, these politicians pay for the initiation of rural women, but their children are not part of it. So they know very well that it is wrong. They protect their children, yet pay for the initiation of rural families. And so you can see that it's a double standard, the hypocrisy surrounding it. That's why it's important to get them involved. Maybe, maybe just to, to share uh, um, a very, very significant uh, data here from Sierra Leone uh, is that according to 28 Too Many, which is a research-based uh, organization, uh, it says that uh, the, the FGM prevalence of the ages between 15 to 49 right now in, in, in Sierra Leone is 89.6 percent, and this is uh, this is uh, a, a significant number uh, 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 for for FGM in, in, in Sierra Leone and. You've mentioned things that uh, which are also very familiar in, in uh, African countries. You've mentioned how female gentle mutilation is is used as a as an election winner. We we have a lot of instances in in other countries where female gentle mutilation people don't talk about it because when you mention it, when you when you stand against it, you will lose uh, popularity. Amazing. And uh, just to mention uh, people who have uh, joined us here, we have Professor Wilberforce Oti. Uh, from the uh, our university lecturer, who is very passionate. Welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Wilberforce. Uh, Jonathan from Oltiasika, Kenya. Thank you. Christine Alphonse, following from Migori County. Maybe just, just to ask, uh, Madam, uh, do we think right now the politicians in Sierra Leone are engaged enough, or we still have room for engaging them in a much better way? We, we, we still have room in engaging them. And that is why we, as recent as two months ago, we've started engaging political party leadership um, because we don't want any one political party to use it against the other political party. So we have about 17 political parties. We have been able to engage 10 political parties and we've engaged the parliamentarians and we have been successful in having an anti-FGM committee established in the House of Parliament. That's a big success. And now we are engaging cabinet ministers. We had wanted to see how we bring them all together, but it has not been possible. So what we have done is meet them one by one in their offices and they've been very cooperative. The discussion has been going on smoothly. Today, we engage with three ministries, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of um, Social Welfare, and the Ministry of Local Government. We've engaged eight ministries. And we have now agreed by the end of November to see how we can bring these eight ministries together and have a presentation wherein we will show the video on the cutting. Thank you. Uh, Jeremiah, I don't know if uh, Mr. Bonfas uh, has joined us yet. I guess not yet. I guess not, not yet. yet. Sorry, yeah, we're still working on that. Sorry. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you so Please much. Uh, we are joined by amazing, amazing participants. We have uh, a women rights activist trainer. Uh, uh, welcome. We have Maggie O'Kane from the UK, Irene from Kenya. Feel free also to join in the conversation. Just uh, you can just uh, throw down a chat down there, or uh, you can just raise your hand to 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 uh, join in the conversation. Amazing, amazing conversation. Uh, maybe maybe just to 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 mention. Uh, right now, right now, what is the situation uh, in terms of policies? Do we think that uh, uh, right now in in Sierra Leone we have we have uh, we are engaging politicians in in making sure that they are part of creating uh, anti-FGM friendly policies. 
um, what we are trying to push is for us as a nation to have a national strategy. Um, there is already a draft national strategy developed by the then government. And so we are trying to lobby this current government to make sure this strategy is approved so that as a country, we have a working document. We need a working document and, and we want this document to be owned by the government. Remember, it's the government who have to report as international community to show how much progress we have made as a country. But let me come to what you said, 28 too many reported on the percentage and 86.6%. In fact, I want to say it has declined. Sierra Leone was 90%. Wow. It was 90%. So with the efforts, the campaign, engagement, a lot of people are coming on board. We have built so many allies all over. Even in the district where it has been very difficult for people to discuss FGM, we've been able to penetrate. So right now we are trying to see. The government is working on reviewing the Trial Rights Act. And in that Trial Rights Act, they want to make sure the age of consent is included. But we are saying, if you talk about an age of consent, just to protect the children, who protects the women? Because FGM is being done to women as well. So who protects the women? And that is why we are asking them to have a national strategy. As a country, we are not in a rush to ask to say, let's have a law, let's have a legislation, no. But let's have a document that can be owned by the government, which we can use to report progress. And in the national strategy, about seven to eight ministries are involved, religious leaders, the cultures themselves, teachers, school, everybody, because we believe it's about change of attitude. So everybody Maybe, needs to come on board. If, if I cut you short, there, there is a big difference between policy making and policy implementation. You, exactly. you think that, uh, uh, how, how do we increase, how do we increase the policy implementation of these already existing policies? Because someone once said that Africa, very good in policy making, but implementation. How do we increase and, the implementation? And, and, you know, and that is what I will always say, even when I was serving as a deputy minister, I say we are, you know, as a country, we don't lack laws. We have so many laws, True. but they are not implemented. And that is why we say in this work to, to end FGM, removing FGM from our bundle bush, we are not asking for a policy. Have a structure. Let's have people come out and speak. We need to have politicians in your campaign messages. Make sure you talk about this. It's about the protection of women. Don't tell them, I am going to build you a bundle house. No. Tell them, I am going to rehabilitate the schools within my constituency. I will make the roads in my constituency. These are the things people want from politicians. But politicians uh, choose the, the cheapest means. Uh, maybe, Madam Rugiatu, I, I don't know if, if you will resonate with this, this data, because they say 69.2 of women in, in Sierra Leone, according to 28 too many, still believe that uh, FDM should, should continue. What, what, what uh, efforts should we put in changing the perceptions? Because this is an amazing number. It's a big number. And uh, I don't know. How, how do we change perceptions? Um, you know, uh, I am not surprised for any research reports. FGM has been in existence for ages. And changing mindset is the most difficult thing. Don't forget, in Sierra Leone, we have the highest um, illiteracy rate amongst women. And it's the women who are performing this. If you call 100 quarters and you ask them, how many of you have ever been to school? For my own area, if you have 100, maybe one will say, I attempted school, class two. So what do you think they know? 
all what they've been taught is just the cutting. And so that is why we are involving different strategies in working to change the mindset of community. Sure. So uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of people are joining in the conversation. Thank you so much. We have Daniel Mukami from cool. Kenya. Thank you so much. We Hello. Have, uh, yes. Sorry, Madam Rugiatu. I was just recognizing our participants. Mm -hmm. You're seeing something? We are using schools. We have the places yep. where, where FGM is performed. We call them the bundle bushes. We engage communities and we remove those bushes and we build schools. So girls who have never been to school come and women come for adult literacy classes. And our adult literacy classes focuses on FGM. We build walls around FGM. This is because we want the women to understand why we are asking for a change of culture. And they explain their suffering. And from those suffering, we develop walls. So they themselves, pass the information to others. And that is why we also train community ambassadors. Remember, this is for the community. We cannot stay in their community forever. So when we train community ambassadors, we get the cutters and the women. Now what we have done is we form father's clubs, mother's clubs, youth clubs, and they engage. This we want community ownership. And that's why we are engaging the different target group, not just the religious leaders. We are also engaging here, you know, we have the male secret society. And these men are actually controlling the female secret society. So we bring them on board. Whatever we teach to the women, we also teach to the men. Because we also don't want the men to feel like, oh, the women have betrayed us. So it's sure. a community thing. Nice, nice. Thank you so much, Madam Rugiatu. I, I want us to take a short break and, uh, and just uh, get uh, input from um, uh, our, our amazing participants here. Uh, and maybe just if you're joining us, we are uh, uh, having a conversation with, with Madam uh, Rugiatu, who is a former um, uh, deputy minister in Sierra Leone and has been in the fight against female genital mutilation for 20 years right now. We are having a conversation on how do we engage politicians? How do we engage the duty bearers? How do we engage, um, how do we engage the, the people who are in the policy making spaces in the fight against mutilation? Daniel Mukami from Kenya says, I want to agree with the fact that our mindsets must now begin to change because no matter how much uh, policies we make, if our minds do not subscribe to them, then it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of hide and seek. Uh, that's according to Daniel Mukami from Kenya. Uh, uh, we have uh, Dennis Maithe, Ma journalist from Tana River. So we, we want to, to take uh, input uh, maybe from the chat section. Uh, also, we uh, I don't know if, uh, Jeremiah, we can have one or two uh, uh, questions so far to uh, Madam Rugiatu also. Uh, but also let's... Uh, 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 give a short break and get a short video from Jeremiah Kipainohi, who is uh, our technical guy uh, from a Guardian uh, Global Media Campaign. Uh, kindly take it away, uh, Mr. Jeremiah Kipainohi. Thanks a lot, Momboleo. Um, this video is a short, um, it's a short summary of uh, proclamations that were made by politicians, uh, mostly presidents, and what impact it has had on ending FGM in different countries. Some of them might be uh, positive, some of them didn't respond well, and we can just see um, what impact that really has on ending FGM in those countries, and really why should we engage these politicians um, to end FGM. So I'll just quickly play it, and um, after that we can go on to the question and answer section, and it's going to be free open floor for all of us to engage. In April this year, we signed a landmark declaration between the governments of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Somalia, and Ethiopia to address cross-border FGM practice. And last week, we signed an agreement 
with religious and cultural elders from Kenya to eliminate FGM by 2022. Female genital mutilation is a retrogressive practice whose continued existence in our country, in actual fact, assaults our individual as well as our national conscience. While once this practice of FGM was rooted in the cultures, the practice no longer has a place within our Kenyan society. This is actually nothing less than an abhorrent assault on the individuality, autonomy, but more importantly, the future well-being of girls and women. And not only does this practice have absolutely no medical or social value, it is also an affront to the Kenyan identity and our common shared national aspiration. For 21 years, I've been researching to see where it is stated in the Quran that this should happen. I've not seen it. As from today, FGM is banned as from today from the surface of this country. I cannot talk anything against FGM. I'm a circumcised woman. Now, you are not only a circumcised woman, but you are also a force in the, of a country. Yes. You are fighting against a child marriage and so on. So you have to, you must have an opinion. I am. Okay, it. listen to me. Give me the statistics first. Tell me how it affects the women. Tell me what it does to the women. Tell me the consequences of it. The law in Sierra Leone is that you cannot circumcise a child until they are 18. If you are 18, would you want to go and circumcise yourself at the age of 18? So what other law do they want? That law is there. It has been passed. It is there. Which other law you want? You want the first lady to go and talk about something that she's already part of. My mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my sisters, my aunties, all of them are all circumcised. When I talk about uh, FGM, people tend to misconstrue my statement. The fact is, I am a circumcised woman. And being a circumcised woman, it's not like I was circumcised when I was 18. I was circumcised when I was a child. So I don't know how it feels like not being a circumcised person. For me to stand there and say FGM is wrong, you have to really believe it from your gut. In Sierra Leone, they talk about it. They say this is happening, but no one has actually given me the proof. No one has given me the statistics to say this is what is going on. The way circumcision is done in Sierra Leone and the way it is done in other places are not the same. You know, um, those horrific stories you hear, they are attached to another country. The people of Sierra Leone voted for my husband to bring changes. And those changes involves women empowerment and making women partners. My husband believes in nothing but gender equality. My husband believes that for a nation to grow, you have to empower the women. FGM is a deep cultural practice in this country. A lot of people are campaigning for its uh, abolition. They've not been successful. We have to, as a society, decide on how it is going to go. And the law there is the beginning. Until you are 18, you are not supposed to be subjected. After 18, you make a decision. That is a good beginning. If you go like that for the next 10, 20 years, this is a practice I believe we die out for itself. But I don't think you want me to commit political suicide. You mean you're not going to commit yourself to banning it? We have a system that is taking care of that very slowly. Very slowly. <laughs> very slowly. <laughs>well um you've all heard uh what different politicians have said um and uh i think i'll give it back to mamboleo but i think some, at some point we'd like to have a discussion on really what really um what impact do do, do these politicians have in terms of policy making in terms of political shifts as well as in the front seats where most of the politicians uh, sit during events on the grassroots as long as well as on national level um, what impact do the awards have on our campaigns? And also um, touch on 
where exactly do we start off knowing that the media, as you have seen in some cases, have the power to change narratives and uh, uh, hold these leaders accountable. But I'll just leave it back to Mamboleo. Thank you. Amazing, amazing videos. They are amazing uh, feedback from some of the, of the people who are, are very powerful in terms of policy. I, I really want to, to mention that um, we, Kenya, has a, Kenya has been uh, very progressive in terms of policies, uh, in terms of pre presidential commitments. I, 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 the president uh, of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, has, uh, has been in several instances uh, quoted uh, openly, um, making sure that uh, he, he leads the fight against female genital mutilation. He has given a presidential commitment of ending female gent genital mutilation up to 2022. So, so that shows how important, how important it is to engage the, the policymakers and, and let just say the powerful people because they hold power, they, they hold their policies. So I think it's very progressive of, of, of Africa right now to engage uh, policymakers in ending female gender mutilation. I'll just read uh, several uh, charts here from uh, Dennis Maitia says, the fact that um, FGM has been associated to culture and religion in some way limits the politicians to freely join in campaigns against FGM because it would affect their political mileage. That's according to uh, uh, Dennis Maitia, who is a journal journalist. Um, I don't know, just keep, keep your feedback coming in, keep your feedback coming in. Uh, uh, he continues to say, can you uh, ever hear a politician when campaigning okay. promise to end FGM? They will promise. Sorry, we have uh, we've, uh, we have have having some interruption. Daoud Yusuf. Sorry, Gabriel Nyabuto, you have something kindly. Yes, yes. Maggie, yes, Maggie, your hand is up. Kindly, let's uh, just uh, show. Uh, Maggie, your hand is up. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mamble. I just. Uh, sorry, my own video. No. It's okay. Uh, Okay, I just, I just, now that we have um, Madame uh, Touré, I just think there's a big debate going on at the moment about the use of uh, cutting videos to, to persuade or to engage with politicians. And I just would like to hear from her, is there a place for this? Because it's very controversial to show graphic imagery uh, to try and engage politicians. W what's your view, Rugiatu, please? Well, well put there. How, how, what is the effect of using graphic images, videos in the fight against uh, uh, female gender mutilation in, in multimedia strategies? Over to you, Madame Rugiato from Sierra Leone. Uh, it seems like we've lost her. Uh, no, no, okay, no, but... I am here. I am here. Okay, okay. I am here. <laughs> Welcome. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we have various strategies we use in campaigning to remove FGM from our Bundu culture. And one of it is by showing the documentary on how FGM is done. And so, in fact, we have agreed with the current cabinet ministers that we've met with to have a presentation and show them. Because if you listen to the video from our first lady, she said, nobody has given her evidence. You know, she doesn't have the evidence. And the truth is we have a lot of evidence. We have a lot of evidence. But the fact also remains that politicians are shying away from talking about these evidences for fear of losing votes. And that's why the president said if they want him to commit a political suicide. So with the documentary, we have been able to convince people to join the fight to eliminate FGM. We showed this documentary in communities with religious leaders and parliamentarians. I remember the first time the parliamentarians watched this. They were like, they don't want to watch. 
we encourage them to stay in the room and watch because this is something they pay for. They always pay for girls to be caught. You have to see what is being done because the way they explain it is they always try to minimize it. But when they watch the documentary and they see what is done, most of them have now joined the campaign. But the problem is in politics, people change their representative. The people we engage in 2017 are no longer in parliament. So it means we have to start again engaging the new parliamentarian. And 2023 is approaching. A lot of them will be changed again. So what we are doing is engaging the civil servants within the different ministries because they are permanent workers and they actually like determine the policies. For, for instance, if you go to the Ministry of Gender, you have the gender director, you have a chief, you have the deputy gender. So as we engage the political wing, we also engage the administrative wing. So when the ministers are relieved or changed, the administrative wing is still there to support the work that we are doing. That was how we were able to influence the development of the strategy. And we are again doing that to make sure we influence that it is approved. So the video is actually helping. Remember, as I said, it's a change of the mindset. It, it, we have to change how people look at this whole thing. And one of the ways to change them is by seeing. You have a lot of doubts in Thomas. They have to see before they believe. Nice, nice. Uh, are you answered, Maggie? Yes, yes, I am. But does does uh, Madam Rakia to understand why there seems to be such reluctance, uh, you know, in the international community to to use this approach? What what's her view on that? There's a lot of resistance, as, as she knows. There's a lot of res res resistance in using uh, graphic images right now. Yes, Maggie, well, that's your question. Yeah, there is a lot of resistance within the inter international NGOs and uh, that, that that these graphic images shouldn't be used. So I just think this is a very you, useful you, you, conversation. You know, you, know, Maggie, um, you know, Maggie, I always tell people what you discuss on social media, what you discuss through the email is different from when you are on ground. This is what people should know. We are fighting to change something that has been in existence for ages. Something that people don't even think is bad. And so most times, like what we, we tell the ministers and the parliamentarians when we engage them, we invite them, come to the community and listen when we engage people. You will realize that the people are actually blind and they don't understand anything. They don't even know that what they are suffering is from the practice of FGM until when you start the, the, the discussion. And so when they see the video, they associate it to their pain. They understand and they accept it. But most times when you communicate in the emails and the offices, people don't understand the reality. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that, that's there's a lot of discussions on, on the strategies we use and um, if they work, if they really work at the at the ground, and and because we have we have to be practical because there's a difference between what is discussed online and uh, maybe in in technical spaces and what is really happening at the ground. But I, I want to get uh, someone else, Mandy David. I see your hand is up, and uh, before I, I bring it, you in. Uh, Mamadou says, if politicians can come to populace and ask for votes during campaign periods, those times are perfect opportunities to have background engagement with relevant stakeholders on FGM. And when they go to the meeting, add representatives of the communities, then they can share issues on FGM as an ask. That's according to Mamadou. How, how we leverage on the uh, 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 campaign platforms to engage politicians on how they will end uh, female gender mutilation. Thank you, Mamadou. Over to you, Mandy David. I see your hand is up. Mandy uh, David. 
Thank you so much, uh, the moderator. My name is Mande David. I am here in Eastern Uganda. I have been in this campaign for the last five years. And I want to start by commenting on the documentary or the, the video that uh, Jeremiah shared. I was much impressed by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya. I think he see him standing and taking lead and guiding the country is a very outstanding that even other leaders in the rest of the African countries that still think FGM can be practiced, need to learn and, uh, and poor relief from the Kenyan uh, leadership. However, I am confident all are in the same point. Yes, every country has got all those uh, enactments, the and FGM Act, we have here in Uganda, but the implementation of it uh, is taking a wrong direction. Here in Uganda, last uh, in 2019, rather than worldwide, and Zoom. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry, we have someone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Kindly go on, Monday. Monday, if you can kindly uh, go on. We, we, we've lost Monday, but uh, Monday was just showing how important it was and uh, how important it was to have this. Uh, uh, commitments by top leadership, and um, he just uh, gave an example of how the president, President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, the president of Kenya, gave out a presidential commitment and how powerful it was. But maybe be before Monday comes comes back, let's hear from Dr. Chris Ogu. Uh, I see your hand is up. Uh, join in, Dr. Chris Ogu. Thank you very much. I just want to appreciate this discussion, it has very potent influence on the way our campaign to end female genital mutilation is going to go throughout Africa. Nigeria, in 2015, enacted a law called Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. This particular law criminalizes uh, female genital mutilation, early child marriage, early child and forced marriage, etc. But like you have all said, the reality is that we are very, very huge in policy enactments and legal enactments. But when it comes to implementation and enforcement, we are very short on that. Having said that, there's something that Maggie raised, the issue of using video clips as part of our tools and strategy for ending female genital mutilation. Here in Nigeria, that has been a very potent weapon we used to change behavior. Parents, academicians, the legislature, when we have opportunity of sh sh sharing with them this tool, it has always made tremendous impact. But the only thing we always keep underscoring and emphasizing is that we try to get the consent of the people who are taking their voices and their pictures, because otherwise we will be completely uh, violating their personal rights and independence. Another challenge we have on which the state actors are very hedgy with is the issue of medicalization of female genital mutilation. Yeah, they say, oh, we have uh, the law has already provided you don't continue to practice female genital mutilation. But the reality is, at the level of government hospitals and rural health centers, this is still being practiced. And so our current campaign is to how to get the legislature, the, the state actor, also put a point of duty that whether female genital mutilation is is practiced in the hospitals or in the homes, they're all the same. And so for us, it's a new level of our campaign to raise this, this, the, the conversation at the level of the state actors to buy into this also, 
Because believe it or not, the challenge we have is that, yes, we have a law, we have, but there is no provision in the budget that will address these issues or how to make it happen. So these are the challenges. So the state actors, the politicians, they still have a very huge role. And Nigeria will be having their next election in 2023. So this will become a campaign issue. Incidentally, in Nigeria, women are more in number in terms of uh, um, voters, voters uh, population. So it's going to be a campaign issue that it's not just whooping up sentiments to get their good votes from women, but this critical issue is always mm -hmm. not always in the front burner. So we want to raise yeah. this issue of genital mutilation as part of our campaign strategy for potential state actors or current ones to begin to make it something that is fundamental and make sure also that it's provided for in the budget. And yeah. then we now have a monitoring plan that we'll be able to monitor against baseline situations. So I want to thank Jim for the opportunity to be in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogu from Nigeria. Amazing input, amazing input. Uh, uh, we want just to share some, some stats here from, from Nigeria. I don't know if you knew that approximately 20 million girls are cut in Nigeria, and the, it's one of the highest prevalence uh, rates in, in Africa. And, I uh, agree maybe, with you. Uh, and we are, agree. and maybe Dr. Ogu, maybe it's time, it's time we have female gender mutilation as a campaign campaign issue. Must have I agree it as a with campaign you. issue. Yes, I yes. Agree and, with you. Rightly, thank rightly you. put, rightly put. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, just to, to get uh, to mention uh, from the chat box, we have uh, Charles Wanyoro uh, says that politicians in FGM prom areas will never publicly condemn the vice during an electioneering year to avoid losing votes. I've heard of politicians having their wives circumcised to win election. That, that that is that that is gross, and uh, maybe it's it's high time we 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 start to openly have this discussion, because uh, just as uh, 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 Madam Minister put it rightly, is that we must have uh, this discussion as a campaign uh, a campaign tool. Thank you so much, uh, Sadia Sadia Hussein from Kenya Tanariva had. Uh, had her hand up. Sorry, maybe Sadia, if you can uh, join in kindly. Sadia, before Sadia joins, uh, Gabriel says uh, the goodwill from stakeholders is the key. Otherwise, end of FGM will not end unless we begin from the grassroots, educating the practitioners of effects of female gender mutilation because policy is implemented at the top level and not the grassroots. Madam Rugiatu had mentioned this. Uh, it's very different whatever happens at, 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 at the social media level or at the media level, the technical uh, spaces is not what is really happening at the grassroots. So it's time we have these conversations done uh, at the grassroots. And if maybe you're joining us, today we are having a very interesting conversation on how to engage policymakers, duty bearers and politicians to end female gender mutilation. And we have uh, an amazing guest Madam Rugiato, who is a former deputy minister from Sierra Leone. Uh, I don't know if, Ma Mag, your hand is up. Maybe you have anything else? Sadia, Sadia is back. Yes, Sadia, kindly join in. Thank you. Hi, Mam Bolea, how are you? I'm fine, Sadia. How is Dana River? Mashallah, we are good, mashallah. mashallah. Yeah, kind, welcome. Okay, so uh, first I wanted to congratulate GMC and you, Mambo Leo, my colleague, for this great uh, webinar. Uh, I'm very happy to join and at least add my voice because, you know, politicians are really um, key stakeholders towards ending FGM uh, simply because, you know, laws are made by politicians. So now imagine uh, we, the grassroots activists, are seen as enemies by the community, yet the law that uh, illegalizes FGM has been passed by the same politicians who now, when they come to the ground, they want to escape, you know, because of uh, fear to lose votes and all that. 
But uh, I want to share some success stories from Tana River. We have been engaging the political leaders. And today I can tell you that from the governor up to MPs and the women rep, the senator, and also the MCAs uh, can actually confidently speak in public about FGM. Reason being, uh, with the support from global media campaign while using the FGM Not My Religion campaign, we, we, we used religious scholars to delink FGM from religion and any platform where religious scholars are speaking, we would also invite the politicians. Let me tell you this, Mamboleo. These political leaders fear so much. And even you, I, I think you have heard Duale, Honorable Duale saying, uh, we respect our religious scholars and whatever they say is what we will follow. That means if religious leaders today can say FGM is not in the Quran, and they can say it's not in the Bible and uh, people should condemn, uh, the religious leaders condemn FGM with one voice. I'm very sure even our political, political leaders will never fear speaking against FGM. And in our respective countries and counties, we really need to bring on board the religious leaders. Let's continue engaging the religious scholars uh, to continue delinking FGM from religion and condemning it with the strongest term possible. And we also invite now the political leaders to speak about FGM and the law and tell the community without fear that, see, Mumesikia Sheikh, you have heard what the Sheikh said or what yeah. the pastor said or what the reverend said, then that gives them, you know, a, a format to use. You heard yeah. what the religious scholar said, so we also support that. And in Kenya, if GM is illegal or in, in, in any other country, that will give them the gateway to freely speak against FGM. Otherwise, if we just say, let politicians come out and speak about FGM, it becomes really hard. But through the religious leaders, it becomes easy and it's possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadia. Sadia is a passionate, passionate advocate from Kenya uh, who uses uh, grassroots activism uh, through media to, um, uh, address female gender mutilation in in uh, in her lo locality and a powerful input, uh, Madam Sadia uh, from Kenya. Thank you. Uh, Mandy David asks uh, a question to our former Deputy Minister, uh, Madam Rugiatu. Uh, what should we do as activists when politicians encourage the courts of law to ask clitory to be produced as evidence in court? It did happen here in Kapchoro, Uganda, and perpetrators given free bond. Madam Rugiatu, over to you. Wow. What should we do? Yeah. It's a powerful to question. Produce, to produce evidence yeah, in the court the of law. Yeah, to be produced <laughs> as evidence in a court of law. You know, it's sad. It's sad for anyone to ask that you should produce the click stories because um the courts as when they cut they remove the click stories i don't normally want to say court because it, 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 it's it's not court per se and when they remove the click stories it is not given to the parents so how can you use this to bring it to a court as evidence but I believe it's just a way of not wanting to take action. Because when you go to, before you go to the court, you first of all go to a police, you are given a medical paper, you go to the hospital to prove that yes, the clitoris is being removed. So what the court should be asking for is not the clitoris, but rather than call the medical person to give evidence and asking for the click stories is actually a, a way of saying we don't need to bother with these cases because they know you find it difficult to bring a click stories to court you know and it is just part of the excuses the judiciary is another um arm of government that is actually not serious in fighting to end fgm the judiciary, and, and, and this are some of the ways they do. 
Here in Sierra Leone, what they do is, if you, if you take a case to the police, the police will investigate, they will have all the facts and they will send the file to a state council to determine whether to charge to court or not to charge to court. So you find out that at the end of the day, the file okay. will be seated in, 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 in somebody's offices with no legal action taken. So for uh, any judiciary to ask for the click to it, tells you that they don't want to take the issue serious. Thank you so much, Madam Rugia. To Mandy David from Capture Uganda, I hope uh, you've been answered. Uh, we, we are trying to focus our engagement to tonight on how do we engage politicians. And uh, Mr. Peter Kimei, your hand was up. Uh, I don't know if you're still there, Peter Kimei. Just uh, did you know section? Uh, I don't know if Ms., uh, the Dr. Ogu is still there. Uh, yeah, before before Kame, before Kame you join us. Uh, I don't know if you knew that 64.3 uh, percent of women in Nigeria. Kame, sorry. Peter. Maybe maybe you can mute Peter for, for now. Peter. Yeah. So uh sixty-four point three percent of women in Nigeria already believe that FGM should be discontinued. I I, I this is very different from uh from what we, we mm -hmm. saw in Sierra Leone. And maybe mm -hmm. Dr. Ogo, you you also uh, mentioned that. Uh, Nigeria has so powerful, very powerful policies. And just to mention, we have, uh, I, 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 I was going through a document by, by uh, 28, not too many. Uh, they shared uh, a lot of other policies uh, by, by the Nigerian government uh, on ending female genital mutilation. So it is, uh, uh, it is important to mention that we have a lot of legislation, but as you right, rightly put it, it is time to focus on implementation. Uh, Kimei, are you back? Kimei? I think Kimei is, is uh, lost. Yeah, uh -huh. Kimei uh, sent a message on the chat box. Uh, this is an amazing con uh, conversation, discussion. We have no option but to ensure politicians take an active role in ending female genital mutilation. Samuel Odor, Odor says this is quite a powerful conversation. Feel free to, to join in the conversation, but uh, right now maybe I, I, I want to, to ask uh, uh, Madam Rugiatu, who uh, is our, our main uh, panelist uh, tonight. Uh, we we uh, are motivated. Africa is motivated by, by success stories. Africa is motivated by, by tangible stories. What, what do you think, or what do you think is a space or is, uh, is the role of using stories and, uh, and live experiences to change the narrative, to influence politicians to take part in female gender mutilation? Um, you know, I always say, as I say, in changing mindsets, you can use different strategies. Using stories, women coming forward to speak is very powerful. Um, we, in our engagements with the cabinet ministers and then the civil servants, today we met with one woman, I give you an example, in the Ministry of Education, and she was like, we have to take action to eliminate FGM. I have been ashamed to speak, but I know what I suffer, given back to my three girls. And she said, the doctor will tell me, just open your legs. You allow yourself to, 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 to remove your click stories, and now you are suffering. But I never knew that the click stories had a role in childbearing. Now that I know, my children will not go through this. So one of the things we asked Carol was, are you willing 
to join us in speaking because we want to bring the ministers together and we will want you to share your experience. You are a highly placed person and they know you've gone through this for the very first time, come out and speak. So it is good we encourage people of influence to speak up. We met with a second female minister again today. She said the same thing and we have encouraged her to come up and speak. Their stories will make a difference. So it is good to have stories. It is good for people to come out and speak. But I always say also as a strategy to get these politicians as well, what we need to do is when they are fighting to be elected, as Nigeria is going to have its election in 2023, and the same with Sierra Leone, let's start by having our candidates, the different candidates. Let's present to them scientific evidence of the health of women because of FGM. Let's have health personnel come out and let's have survivors give their testimony to them. And then together with campaigners, we will now be able to influence them even in their campaign period to speak. Because when you allow them through doing that, they have a commitment already. The people already know them. You are not voted for to come and support the continuation of FGM. You are voted for for something else. So let's start from the moment they, 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 they have the aspiration to run for offices. But powerful, serving powerful. of survivors is good. Powerful, Madam Murgiatu. Just to quote Chimamanda Ngozi, Chimamanda Ngozi, a powerful uh, writer said, Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. So that's the mm -hmm. power of stories. That's the power of using live stories to influence politicians and duty bearers to change their perceptions towards making sure that female genital mutilation, uh, ending female gen uh, genital mutilation is a priority. Mora Obiria says only politicians who are passionate about protecting the rights of girls and women can go against the tide to discourage FGM, and often they are women. That's according to Mora Obiria. So uh, Joyce Mwangi, I see your hand is up kindly. Uh, uh, welcome. Feel free to join the discussion. Joyce Mwangi. Uh, good, uh, sorry, D8, good evening. Um, it, this is such a wonderful debate. Uh, my contribution is that I feel from the response that I have just had uh, from the last speaker, I'm just wondering why women need to prove that it is wrong to be mutilated. Why do we need to prove? Isn't it a human right? I think what we need to do is strengthen legislation, strengthen the and make sure there are reforms within the judiciary make sure that there are laws that prohibit FGM. And if they, are, they, they already exist, try to strengthen more so that those that have gaps can be filled. Now, in countries where the laws are not there, that is what we should be working on. Where we have uh, human rights, uh, practitioners, our some of the politicians who uh, support F uh, the end of FGM coming together and starting to put down legislation and policy. And we have forces of women coming up. Unless we women are not already convinced that we are in trouble, we, have, we are in problems. I don't understand why someone would ask for a clitoris in court. I mean, why don't they ask for a penis in court? I think it's high time we started thinking uh, thinking in a way that we are informed. If a lady has, has undergone FGM, it means that the first place, because there's bleeding, there's pain, there's trauma, the first place that woman should, or lady should be taken to is a hospital. 
and if that host and, and that hospital is supposed to give evidence to the police that this girl or this lady or this woman has undergone FGM and not necessarily the clitoris, there are other parts that are cut within the FGM uh, we know. So there are frameworks that we use for referrals from a, 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 a medic to a doc, uh, to, to a police officer, to a child protection officer, all the way to the judiciary. So that lineage should be a pathway where every country should, should have a framework of, so that we know how to refer these cases, so that we don't lose them. Otherwise, we lose them in court with unsubstantial information that is given by people who do not want FGM to end. How can you ask for clitoris, surely? I mean, there are, so that means that there is no goodwill to stop FGM. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you. Uh, jo 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 Jocelyn Mwangi. I concur with you. Female gender mutilation is a right issue. Female gender mutilation is a gender issue. Female gender mutilation is a policy issue. And you have rightly put it. Jeremy, uh, you want to uh, say something? Uh, just wanted to add to that uh, because she's also mentioned uh, issues to do with legislation. Um, I have seen here in Kenya that once the president made a declaration to end FGM by 2022, not just the not just the, the executive, his um, arm of government that made changes, but we also saw the Office of the Director of Public Pro Prosecution uh, nominating uh, 50 female uh, judges, prosecutors to um, escalate or make it easier to end FGM. You've seen how parliament has responded as well uh, with the policies that have been passed. So I just think it's really important for us to think about why do we really need to end FGM uh, and include politicians in the, in, in the long run? What impact do they have in the campaigns? And I just want to throw that to everyone as we continue having this conversation. Um, what impact does your local politician in the long run have on ending FGM? And for me, on my personal perspective, every time I go to grassroots meetings in my village, the people who normally sit on the front seats, the people whose airtime, the people who have much more time to speak in public is normally the politicians, starting from the uh, member of county assembly, even from the office of the president as well. They are not politicians, but we also have the chiefs who are having a lot of uh, let's say political power in the long run. So uh, what I'm just trying to uh, share with you is that uh, we have to think at it, uh, about it from the ground level on how do really politicians have an impact in our campaigns. I gave an example earlier on of uh, politicians bailing out uh, perpetrators of FGM. Those who are marrying off, or uh, basically it's not marriage, but they are, let's just say, marrying off young children. Uh, and they are bailed out when they are taken to a court of law. But because they have power, then the legislation is not able to stop them. But if you have strong laws that are passed by legislators who are politically, are, are politicians, are people who are elected, then, um, then we'll have power to speak out as, as activists. You don't want to go to a place and speak about FGM and then your local MP says that that person has not done right and should be punished for it. So. Maybe you have another uh, another view, but yeah, take it over. Pa powerful, powerful, Mr. Jere Jeremiah, powerful, powerful. And maybe just to, to mention something uh, I, I'm seeing here on, on the chat box, politicians need to come out bold and stand for the truth. Laws are made in parliament, but the lawmakers themselves cannot come out loud to speak against it. Eco uh, Dennis continues to say in Kenya, we have positions for women representatives in all 47 counties. Couldn't they come out with one voice to end FGM just like they have many initiatives? That's according to Dennis Mathia. Very good, uh, uh, thank you for your contribution, Samuel Odor. I think this whole idea needs a collective effort. The politicians who come from regions that practice FGM can start the fight, and I'm sure the other members will join in and become a, a national movement. Uh, Washington says the fight against FGM should be part of agenda even in their campaigns. Politicians have a big role in ending FGM. Right now in Kenya, for information, we're having, uh, we, we're heading to a general election. Is it time we question, is it time we put to task politicians 
uh, through their, their manifestos, through their agendas, on making sure that they prioritize ending female gender mutilation. Uh, Ronald Ketel, Transformers Kenya, thank you for joining us from BOMET. It's an amazing conversation. How do we engage uh, politicians in the fight against, uh, uh, against uh, female gender mutilation? We, 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 are, um, we want to ask ourselves also, um, because at the end of the day, uh, the global media campaign is one of the most powerful uh, programs of leveraging media platforms to end female gender mutilation. But now we want to ask ourselves, uh, Madam Brogiato, how, how then now do we bring on board these politicians? Which is the best strategy of using media to bring these uh, politicians on board or duty bearers or policymakers or people in the policy making spaces? Okay, um, first, you, you, when we talk about the media, most time we want to limit ourselves to the television and then the radios. But I want to say we can use politicians in their town hall meetings to speak. And that was why I said, when they start their campaign, when they start their campaign as aspirants, we need to make sure we bring them together. From that moment, they need to speak on FGM. So the people know when they come, they will not be putting their money for the initiation of girls and women. So in their town hall meetings, don't forget, politicians are the champions. You know, the old big town hall meetings. And they are highly respected. They know, they know how to convince people. And what we are doing is a way of trying to convince people to change their ways, their mindset. And so let's have them in their town hall meetings. That's the first thing they have to do. And then the second thing, is how do we bring media people to talk to them and record them? Because if you take them straight to the radio, to the media, they can mess you up. They change the whole thing. So sit with them, interview them, bring them to where you want to take them. First, begin the discussion with things that they like. And then you bring FGM. Let them speak freely and record them. You take their voice to the media, to the radio, so people listen. But if you bring them on the spot on the radio, they will change their voice, they will change the message and they mess you up. So that is why it is important that activists engage them. I have always said the journalists, the role for journalists in this media campaign should be moderated. They should be moderated. The activists train the people. They identify the people they've trained. They bring them to the radio and the journalists who are trained moderate because they know the right questions to ask. So you see a kind of connection in trying to end FGM. The, the, the journalists cannot be the panelists speaking. No, we want the people to own the fight. And that is why the activists train the people, bring those people, let them, and um, as we have, what we did in one of our constituency was we invited the member of parliament to the engagement at the community engagement. And he came, they wanted me to introduce him. And I said, no, he will be the last person we, we will introduce and he'll be the last person to speak. So we started the engagement. We had the quarters and chiefs and everybody speaking. So he saw in that conversation that everybody was willing to say, we have to stop FGM. We have to stop cutting our gas. He had no option rather than to add his voice to say, my own children are not caught. He had to confess. Had we asked him to speak earlier, he could have spoiled the whole meeting because he would have come to impress the people as if the activists have come to destroy culture. But because we opened the discussion and everybody was positive in stopping, he confessed to say, I have two daughters. They have not gone through the practice. 
And so at that moment, we told the community, have you now seen what we have been saying? Because he is educated, he is spending his money to get his children educated, and his children will have to come later to ask for position while your own children will be languishing. So now listen to him. And then we say, what do you want your MP to do? Ask him. This is on the spot now. Let him tell us what he will have to do. He promised to build a school. We are following up with him. So we help him and the people to make sure the people they voted for fulfill their promise. But if you call them and you ask them to speak, they mess you up. Let them sit, let them observe and listen. When we had the religious leaders in Bo, Bo is the second city in Sierra Leone. And it's also in the region where FGM originated. So in the Southern region, people believe that when you set up FGM, you want to destroy their heritage, you know? So what we did was to have an engagement first with religious leaders. And we, we, we asked them, they were like, no, no, this is, we said, you have to come and see. Let's sit and discuss. Even the media guy that we invited was so much afraid. At the end of the engagement, the four religious leaders, influential, stood up. One of them said, I was among the religious leaders who led the religious people to talk to the then president not to sign the abortion bill. He said, but had the people who we are campaigning engage us as you are now doing, we would have supported them. Now you have enlightened us and we are going to join you. So after the engagement, I said, are you now willing to join me to the radio? Because I want to have a radio discussion. And three of them accepted to go with us. We went on the radio for the very first time and they spoke openly. So um, as, as a, a victim and a survivor, I have used my experience to speak openly with the documentary, the videos, showing how it is done. And that was the time the religious leaders started looking into their books. That was the time they started bringing what should not be done? So you see, if had it been sending just a journalist, they would have created commotion. So the journalists now use the people we have engaged as media graduates to ask the right questions for the people. And the next engagement we had was with the musicians. Because we want to have a mixture. And we told the musicians, you are singing for this politician. We want you to start singing for them or against them to stop funding the initiation of girls. And we, we took them to the radio. So now that we have them, we are trying to see how we influence. Elections are coming. We have started engaging the media, calling. We will begin to call them out. When we know you have paid for the initiation, we call your name. In this constituency, you have paid for this. Have you rehabilitated the school you have? You have so many schools. What have you done? So they don't vote you in again. You we are not voted for FGM. You know. So some of the things we will have to do is also call them out. Let the people know. They have a responsibility to protect yeah. people. Sure. So but, you take your time before you bring them to the media. Make sure you don't start with FGM because they will mess up your campaign. Amazing, amazing input. Madam Rugiatu Nene Ture from Sierra Leone, former uh, deputy minister, oozing wisdom right here on how to engage media and politicians. And she says politicians can be very, very elusive when uh, you have, have them on the live interviews. I don't know what you think, but Pamela Umodo says, during press briefings, the media should always pose the FGM uh, stand question to all political candidates and be intentional in airing the same. What do you think, Madam Rugiatu? During press briefs, the media should always pose the FGM stand questions to all candidates just to be very intentional in airing the same. 
Yes, that is why I said during their campaign, they should make them commit themselves. And that is why in Sierra Leone, we have started engaging political parties. What are we looking for from those engagements? We want to make sure these political parties make a commitment. They have to make commitments. And so the journalists should come as we are engaging to ask questions. They need to ask them. We need to know who are the politicians that are actually coming in to work for the protection of women and girls. And who are those that will be coming in to exploit our women? Because they are exploiting them. They realize that women make up a percentage of ignorant women in, in, in the country, the population in the country. And so they want to exploit them. The questions the journalists will be asking will teach you some lesson, will create awareness. And then we, as activists, We'll go to the community and talk to our people. We will we, we, we cannot just leave them to continue to mislead our community. No. True, true, true. Uh, well put there by Madam Rugiatunene. We, we we want to uh, uh, in the next few minutes uh, I'll be I'll be I'll be bringing in uh, Maggie uh, uh, from GMC, but not before uh, Botemi Oguni uh, comes in kindly. I see your hand is up, uh, Botemi. Are you with us, Botemi? Botemi, your hand has been up for some time. I, I, I don't want this to, anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, let me uh, read some, uh, uh -huh. Uh, Mora Obiria says the civil society and the media, which is for the state, should make them understand the cost of FGM. Dennis uh, Maithia, Dennis Maithia, your, your hand is up. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I would like just to point out something about, uh, I, I, I can approve that some of these uh, anti-FGM campaigners are very good at what they do because here in Tana River, I have witnessed some of them, they compose anti-FGM songs and even sing them when there's, there's some political gatherings, they are invited to participate. Something that I will recommend, maybe even after participating, they should come and also involve the leaders because you will find them when they sing those anti-FGM songs, the politicians will come and dance along with them and they they make some 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 good uh, comments with them but now at the end of it all i think the anti fgm campaigners are very influential in the grassroots and they should now hold those leaders accountable because at the end of it all they are fighting for the community so i think after even doing some of those meetings with them they should hold them accountable and tell them that this thing that maybe there are, there are laws that are in kenya for example the anti fgm act but at the end of it all, why that we have those laws, but we don't hear the, the politicians now coming to the public and telling them that we have these laws against FGM. Why should it just be like the, the anti-FGM campaigners that don't tell people about the laws that are put in place? So I think the politicians now need to know that even as they come to the ground, that if these laws are passed in parliament, why should they emphasize the people that it is wrong? And also a question to ask myself now that, we give empowerment to to women so to say that now we have enabled women to become leaders in kenya we have 47 counties and we have women leaders but we haven't seen them coming together saying that now we want to fight against fgm they have different initiatives you will find them going to maybe mama's initiative voting the mambogas etc but why don't we see them now campaigning saying that fgm is a menace we should come together and fight it if they don't come up themselves to bring the, the vibrance in it, do you expect even maybe, uh, for example, the male politicians to champion for it? We are not saying that men cannot champion for FGM. Indeed, they can. But it should come now from the women leaders who have that opportunity to tell the people that let's stop FGM. And I feel that if now we have these women leaders serious about FGM and they go in their campaigns telling the community that now, we want to fight against FGM. Without doubt, even the community will come to buy to their ideas. 
also look at we, we, as we also look at the religion you know when religion comes into place not, not everyone will come and say that now i'm talking about this because at the, at the end of it all they also fear that they might be seen to be going against the religion and because some of these politicians believe in the religion in the, in the community levels now we want you to, to come for maybe uh, mp we want you to to campaign for governor so now if you go against the wazes maybe what they feel you might be left out so some of them fear but now if the religious leaders go and say it in public in the places of worship that fgm is bad even politicians will not be afraid to tell it in public because already the pub the public have heard from the religious leaders i can tell you even not about culture people leave cultures that are harmful but when it comes to religion we are hooked into religion so we need these religious leaders of us to tell us it is wrong so that even the politicians when they go to the people and tell them it is wrong they can even refer to the religious leaders i think that way we'll even make it easier for the politicians at least to be talking without fear thank you it's okay thank you thank you so yes, much dennis from tanariva everyone Yes, Botemi, Botemi, kindly come in, then uh, we, uh, Thank we go on. I apologize, it was my network playing on me over there. Okay, so I want to okay. say okay. Madam Thure is doing a very good job. I am amazed at um, the wisdom she has been churning out since, and I want to appreciate her, and I, I hope that um, some of these things will come to fruition very soon. Um, the very first thing that comes to the elite's mind when you talk about FGM is... Um, attaching clitoris to sexual pleasure. And that's the same thing with the first study of Sierra Leone. Uh, she, like she said, she doesn't even have data of how FGM affects women. So I guess the only thing that um, affected her was the fact that she didn't have sexual pleasure. And in Africa, it seemed like women are so, they're not supposed to have sexual pleasure. So convincing a woman like that, that um, FGM has other effects, she must see data. And I think that we should begin to work from there. Then we also talked about video evidence on television. I have done something like that before when I was producing a TV program. And prior to that, four or five days before, we'd had um, um, jingle on television to say that we're going to have something on FGM and the graphics will be a little bit horrifying. And we had prepared the mind of the people I actually had to write to NBC. That's like um, the body that takes care of rules and regulation covering the media in Nigeria, just to give them a heads up on what is going to happen on that Monday morning. And it was quite an overwhelming program. So I think that uh, putting video evidence drives home the point more. And then the fact that most of the girls are caught when they are small, it seemed like, oh, she was a baby. She doesn't feel the pain. So it's okay to cut them when they are when they are small, but when you when, when you grow up a bit, they'll be like, oh, now she's grown, and then she might feel the pain. But let's do it when she's a baby, when she won't, you know, realize what's going on. I also want to talk about um, politicians and you know talking about the act and the laws. Dr. Chris talked about um, the violence against person bill in Nigeria, and the fact is that. That bill was at the national level, and every state in Nigeria had to localize it. So if, if we're talking about talking to the president, maybe we should also look at talking at our local politicians. I, I think they call them MPs over there. But in Nigeria, we have three tiers of government, the very local government, the state's government, and then the federal level. So let's take this fight to the local levels, the very ones, the grassroots politicians. That's what we call them in Nigeria. Because the state governor, when he's campaigning, he comes to your area once a year. After that time, you don't see him again until the next election. But the local government chairman will be in your environment. It will be in your community. It will be with you. Let's start to engage this ones better for us to drive home the laws against FGM. And finally, on um, the politicians and religious leaders, Sadia mentioned that um, they have, religious leaders actually have a lot of influence on our politicians, and I agree. Apart from the um, traditional uh, leaders in Nigeria, the Christian and Muslim leaders are very, very important. 
So if we want our politicians to actually confess an end to FGM, maybe we should have the Sultan of Sokoto, who is the head of who is the head of the Islam, most of the uh, Muslim um, um, faithful in the northern part of Nigeria to say FGM is bad. And then we can have the same, like the Khan president or whatever it is, in the southern part to a very, very huge um, workforce on FGM. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot tonight. Thank you so much, Botemi from Nigeria. Well put. I can't say uh, more. So uh, we, we want to get to a, a very, very important section on what next. Now, what, what do we do next after now realizing how important it is to engage politicians in the fight against female gender mutilation? Definitely, Madam Rugiat will go first, but uh, kindly, if you have any, any uh, suggestion on, on, uh, on the action points, kindly you can just put them on the, uh, on the chat box. But we'll give one minute to anyone who has wants to go on audio. Uh, let's first go uh, uh, with uh, Madam Bugiatu. Then uh, we'll take a few um, few points on the action points. Then I will invite Maggie from London, UK. Kindly. Um, one of the things we have to have in mind is the insincerity of most politicians. They are very much insincere they might offer you when you call them polite responses you know and they give you pleasing answers but when you turn your back then the reality prevails what am i trying to say when you engage them make sure you have as i said the conversation for things that you think, because um, in our programs, what do we do? Whatever work we do, whether it's education, whether it's sanitation, whether it's agriculture, it's all FGM centered. It's all FGM centered. We say water well against FGM. And when we bring the water well to your community, as a politician, we invite you. You are representing the people. You, you, you have to come. You get the local politicians, we call them the councillors, and then the members of parliament. We invite everybody to come. And then we bring the media. We are bringing the water as person for that word or constituency. And then you want your people to think you have influenced us to offer them water. So you have to practice of FG. We've trained you. So you come when we organize the workshop in the community, you bring them. So I just want to advise most times people do other projects separately. If you are working against FGM, whatever project you do, make sure it's FGM direct. That's what you want to achieve. You want to make sure FGM is eliminated. So bring it. Engage these politicians with sincerity. As I said, I enter into it because I want to make sure I prove that what they are saying is not true. But attach it with developmental projects. Speak to them and show them the evidences. You know, we have a lot of evidences on FGM. Anybody who tells you that I have not seen this evidence is not sincere. It's all politics. We have a lot of research. UNICEF have done a lot of research. UNFPA, they are all available. People have seen them, but people ignore them because they know majority of the women are ignorant. They just want to make sure they gain their vote. So we just have to make sure that our politicians, whether local or national or appointed, understand why we are fighting against FGM. And if they are serious about reading the vote of the majority, who are the women, they have to be sincere in protecting them. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Rugiatu. Washington Othiambo, very true. Media are also very key in conveying the FGM advocacy messages by the politicians. It is true that FGM campaign is under, underlooked in terms of budget allocations. Politicians, in most case, cases, will raise, uh, will raise a voice uh, when there is death or complications related to FGM. There is still need for meaningful engagement of all stakeholders, including religious leaders, teachers, and grassroots, lead, uh, grass, grassroots leaders. Thank you so much, Washington. Well put, just as, uh, as what uh, uh, Botemi had mentioned, uh, the importance of making sure that we engage the grassroots leaders. Uh, she mentioned the, the local uh, uh, administration, uh, equivalent to the members of county assembly, maybe in Kenya. So that, that's how uh, powerful it is. From the Gambia, Adam M says, uh, from the Gambia, I believe we can engage women in political parties to get them uh, talk about FGM and also take a stand on the issue. That's from Gambia. But but I have I have a question. I have a question, uh, people. Why do we think? Uh, because more than one person has mentioned that it is important just to engage women leaders. Where are where are the men? Where are the men, Rugiatu? PM, you just don't engage women leaders. In fact, most of our leaders are men. So if you say you engage only women leaders, we will never achieve our objective of ending FGM. Come to the Sierra Leone Parliament. We have 136 parliamentarians, and you have only 10 women. If you say you engage only the women, we will never be successful. What we did during the engagement was, after we've been able to engage the old parliament, when we formed the anti-FGM committee, a woman is a chairperson. That's fine, but all the rest are men. Remember. It's the men who are financing the procedure. It's the men who are financing it. It's the men who give the permission. So they are key if we want to end FGM. Our presidents are men. <laughs> uh, the speaker of parliament are men. Our chairmen in council, they are all men. When you come to the family, the fathers in Africa have a say. So there is no way we just engage women leaving this men. In fact, what we are doing is we have what we call now the men involvement in the campaign. Most of our religious leaders are men. If they don't take the lead, who are you going to convince? So it's them and us working together. True, it is us and them working together. It is them and us working together. It's multi-sectoral, everybody on board. They say leaving no one behind. That's according to uh, Madam Rugiatu Nene Ture, uh, former uh, deputy minister from Sierra Leone. Remember we are live on Facebook. Uh, uh, Jeremiah, what's uh, our hashtag? Maybe I, I know it's late, but maybe just can, we can just mention it. All right, uh, that's one thing that we need to vote on after this session, Mamboleo. Um, so okay, we perfecto, to perfecto. On to go on perfecto, perfecto. Thank you so much. Uh, any, any, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Ogu wants to uh, share an action point. Welcome, Dr. Tari. Welcome, Dr. Chris. Thank you very much, Dominic. I just want to um, share my action points that I think are very valid. Number okay. one, in Nigeria, we do have, in Nigeria, at the uh, continental level, we have Men Engage Nigeria Network. This is a coalition of civil society organization members that are committed to working with men and boys to drive home the issue of making sure that female genital mutilation and other violence against women are and stopped in Nigeria. So what I just want to underscore the point that we certainly cannot do without working with men and boys. Otherwise, the, 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 the crusade will not be successful. Number two, I'm very happy with what 
someone mentioned about the issue of mainstreaming FGM in all discussions, development discussions in our various countries. Because if we just, if FGM as a standalone discussion point may not achieve the desired, but if we mainstream it in all discussions, especially as it affects the politicians, when they have a rally to do and you are privileged to be part of what they're doing, you make sure that your discussion in your you make sure that you mainstream female genital mutilation issue as a key point for discussion. Uh, I'm saying it from the backdrop of having I've served in government and retired as head of service of the state civil service. So that the, the, the way my the minds of politicians work, they would always want to know what is in it for me. So we must always keep in mind that they need the votes. But we want to also have a bargaining power that if they need our votes, they must also address issues that pertain to women. Because in the final analysis, the women actually that do most of the voting. Most men on the day of voting will be playing draft and all that. So we need to have a trump card, which is to make sure that the issues of female genital mutation are in the front burner in any discussion, which is why I said it's going to be a major campaign issue in 2023. And thank you. Thank you because we must achieve our objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris uh, from, uh, uh, from Nigeria. Uh, Dominic. Thank you. Uh, Thank uh, this you. Say better late than never. Our, 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 we, we were to have uh, two panelists tonight, um, uh, Madam Rugiatunene and Mr. Bonfa Seminalo. I can, I can see Bonfa, uh, Honorable Bonfa Seminalo has, has joined us finally. Maybe we can just say a word, Mr. Bonfa, because we are almost uh, uh, through with uh, this very, very uh, historic uh, session. Maybe if you can say a word uh, before we. <laughs> We close it up kindly. For joining very late. Um, further, I suggest this of the office cropped up that made me not to join at the right time. But I want to sincerely thank the organizers for the for picking up to the front corner the subject matter of FGM. And uh, I'm so sorry I missed the discussions and um, the suggestions by many. But I wish to equally point out that whatever way we are picking out to get the solution to the problem, we should realize that leaving the woman alone to be both the victim without allowing the men that cause the dangers to walk free should be a way to be discouraged. You know, when the incident happens and they get involved with maybe a VVF cases, the women suffer alone and the man is so free. And it's like the law has been meant by men to um, put women in such pain and distress. I'm so sorry I missed the discussion, but uh, it's a subject matter I'm interested in. It's a subject matter I know that politicians will shy away from because most of them equally cause the problem because of the... Um, uh, uh, where and uh, be able to and air my view the way I think I should. I'm so so sorry I joined late and um, I couldn't hear the discussion from others, but I'm sure that everyone who participated will put in extra effort in their various countries to ensure that FGM is dealt with by is a human creation and is human beings that <sighs> to solve it. Thank you so much. Uh, has been a legislative director and clerk of the National uh, Assembly of Nigeria over 20 years, determined to end FGM across Nigeria, and uh, uh, he was to be with us. But thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, In Kenya, we say better let than never. So over to you, Maggie. Uh, then I will give it back to Jeremiah for uh, final thoughts. Thank you. Welcome, Maggie. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very, very interesting discussion. So uh, the Global Media Campaign, if, if people don't know us, we, we've been working for the last seven years. Our job is to serve you. Our job is to hear, as we understand it, that uh, the solutions of how you engage politicians or how you fight FGM are very much localised ones. They're different in Sierra Leone. They're different from Gambia. Sometimes it's female politicians. Sometimes it's involving uh, local projects. There are different tactics that can be used in different countries and, and, and cultures. So we think it's very important that it is you, the activists, who work out what you want to do uh, to, to bring politicians, uh, in, to involve politicians in this, in this struggle. We believe media can be very helpful to that, but what, how you do media is up to you in your country. So I just wanna say, it's been a, a long talk. And I think at this stage, I want to be very practical and say the global media campaign is working in, in the Gambia, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Sierra Leone, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, and in Mali and in Guinea. And what we do is we hear from you your ideas about how best to engage politicians. So after this uh, conversation, we will be preparing for 16 days of activism in November. We will be uh, sending out to you to hear from you your ideas of how you want to use the media to get the politicians on, to challenge the politicians, the politicians to give information for whatever, whatever way you think will work in your community. So we'll be sending out how to get in contact with us. We're going to have a big push for 16 days of activism in November. So politicians all over Africa are going to be talking about FGM, going to be challenged on FGM. And so, so watch this space. And thank you for moderating a wonderful, fascinating discussion. I learned so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you so much, Maggie, all the way from London, UK, here in Kenya. We are so happy, so, so happy for uh, having all this uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the serious input. So uh, Jeremiah wants to have some fun with us tonight. Uh, I don't know what uh, he wants us to uh, to do. Over to you, Jeremiah. <laughs> I think it's really Mamboleo. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly uh, have uh, one minute from you. And uh, as Maggie said, we'll have uh, campaigns on the days of uh, on the sixteen days maybe, of activism. Maybe Jeremiah, I don't know if I can. Uh, 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 something is burning from uh, Sadia. I don't know if I'm cutting in short, Sadia. <laughs> one minute, Sadia. Less than one minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mamboleo. Okay, I wanted to say something. Um, many people have here mentioned about women leaders, and also women. The last person said women should be the front line in ending the practice. Okay, we really need men to also support us in this fight uh, to end FGM. But most of the time, when you, you invite men to talk about FGM, they will ask you a question. Why didn't women who have gone through FGM acknowledge that what happened to them was wrong so that we'll be able to support them to end this vice. And even with the politicians, we have women leaders who have gone through FGM. They are survivors of FGM. So the fact that they are silent means that this is a big challenge for us, even convincing the male political leaders, because if these uh, survivors could speak and say, what happened to us was bad, and we really don't want other girls or young innocent girls who are voiceless at the grassroots to go through the same, then men would also feel that this is a problem and we should end it. But the fact that women are just silent really means a big challenge to us. So women survivors who are leaders to also speak and we should start with them so that they can share the experience and we influence more male allies to support the campaign. Thank you. Well, well put. Thank you so much, Sadia. Thank you so much, Sadia. That is well noted. Over to you, Jeremiah. Thank you very much, Sadia and Mamboleo as well. Um, very quickly, we will uh, do a quick poll because as Maggie said, we'll have the 16 days of activism where we will 
be campaigning basically um, on uh, politicians uh, to end FGM or just engaging politicians to end FGM in Africa. So uh, we have a very quick poll on preferred hashtags. We'll continue researching on this and asking people for opinions on what they would like to use. But I'm just going to launch this really quickly. Please vote. And uh, from then on, we'll see what you prefer. And then Mombaleo can close this. Thank you very much once again. And uh, see you soon, Azin. Are we done? Not yet, just a few of us have voted so far. Uh, we have 17 votes. Let's keep going. Um, if you have any challenges voting, please let me know and, and we'll see how to help each other. But uh, so far, so good. Um, at 62%, the preliminary results, we have the first hashtag, politicians to end FGM. Um, uh, five people voted for politi political goodwill to end FGM and elected leaders to end FGM at 14%, and that's three people. Let's keep voting. We have 30 more seconds. All right, just give uh, one, let's give 10 seconds for the two that haven't voted yet. All right, so uh, I'll end the poll and uh, thank you very much for participating. I'll share with you the results so that you can see for yourself. <laughs> And uh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have politicians to end FGM for this session and uh, we will keep engaging more and more campaigners and uh, we'll finally agree on what to use for the hashtag as we go on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremiah, uh, from my desk here. I have nothing more to add all the way from Sierra Leone, all the way to Nigeria, back here in Kenya. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. See you next time. Politicians and female gentle mutilation. Thank you. <laughs>